Um, my name is Barney Bernstein. I'm the Senior Director of Plant Services with Sustainable Oils. I actually uh, live in Wilmington, North Carolina, but uh, spend about uh, every second or third week in uh, the Golden Triangle of Montana. Mike? Yeah, I'm Mike Karst. I'm Vice President of Ag Operations for Sustainable Oils. And like Barney, I spend a lot of time in uh, Montana. I'm there about every other week. Uh, typically make my base of operations in the Haver, uh, Montana area. Barry. Oh. Hi, yep, hi. Hello. Oh, Barry, go ahead. Barry, Great. you go ahead. Sure, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Barry Murphy. I'm uh, the uh, commercial director with, um, with Exxon Mobil and uh, I'm, I look after the uh, Rockies and West Coast uh, region and uh, really pleased uh, to be with everyone uh, today. I'll uh, pass it to uh, Jose. Hi, thank you, Barry. And my name Hi, is my Jose name Aparicio. Aparicio. I'm with ExxonMobil and a strategic and advisor. And I'm very excited today to be with uh, Source Oil and all of the gentlemen present. Nancy? Thanks, Jose. Um, yeah, I'm Nancy Applequist, Director of Operations um, with Sustainable Oils. So I'll be the person who's helping physically move the seed and get it to where it needs to go. Uh, Amy? I'm Amy Thornberry. I work um, also with Sustainable Oils and I do accounting and other um, back office support. Chuck. Farm kid from uh, Sun River, Montana. <laughs> Raised some camelina in past years, maybe 10 years ago. Okay, great. Um, I have a call from one of the participants, so let me take that and um, Mike, if Clark, you're going around. Clark, Clark, go ahead. Clark? Okay, we can't hear Clark, so John McFarland. Yeah, I'm John McFarland with CHS Big Sky in Broadview, Montana, and I'm the account manager here. Okay, Kevin Donnelly? Yeah, I'm a farmer over here in Superior, Montana. I've grown three or four crops of Camelina in the past. Where, where is Superior, Montana? I'm between Missoula and Lookout Pass on Interstate 90. I'm not allowed to go anywhere that looks so nice, Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> and Tom Kirsting. Hi, I'm Tom Kirsting. I'm the CEO of the South Dakota Soybean Processors. I'm located here in Volga, South Dakota, in the eastern part of the state. Just hoping to learn more about Camelina today. Okay. And Clark, did you get your uh, audio issues Fixed. Are you able to introduce yourself? All right. Barney, do we have someone else joining us? Uh, yeah, I have uh, one other guy who's been trying to log in, and apparently, yeah, here he comes. Sorry. George. As I was saying, Mike, there, there's few meetings that go by without any uh, without any technical challenges. Yeah, I, I uh, it seems like every meeting we have, there's something that goes on. Barney, I, shall we I, go ahead and get started? I think we shall. Can yeah. So, Kevin, you probably got the most snow out of all of us. How much did you get in this last pass? No, I didn't get anything. I'm I'm down to trying to be bare ground, but we've still got six to eight inches of frost, so everything's mud right now. Okay. Well, uh, just west of, or just east of uh, Haver, I, I talked to a grower this morning that had four inches, so he was pretty happy this morning. Okay. John, did you guys get anything down by Billings? Nope, it's been... Uh... 
we, we've had pretty nice weather, just a little bit cool in the mornings, but uh, we're out. Uh, we've got our spreader crew out going this morning, so things are looking good. Okay, Clark, I got your message. So Clark's from Ledger, Montana. And uh, Clark, I I, uh, I did some work with Kim Lane in that Ledger, Montana area about a decade ago. So we may have to touch base and compare notes. Hey, Nancy. Yes. Can you resend the invite to George Waldner, W-A-L-D-N-E-R? Sure. I bet he's trying yesterday's and it's not working. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Sure. Arnie, let's go ahead and get started. Yes, we should. Okay, very good. Thank you all for uh, participating. We're glad to have you as a part of this. Uh, on today's webinar, uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about Camelina, a little background on who Sustainable Oils is, um, our marketing partner in ExxonMobil. Uh, they're here to talk about why they're interested in Camelina as a, a feedstock for renewable diesel and the interaction with um, our parent company, Global Clean Energy Holdings and Sustainable Oils. A um, little bit about why, sh why grow Camelina and how to grow Camelina, and then we'll talk about contracts at the end. So with that, let's jump into it. So what is Camelina? It's, a, uh, it's an oil seed crop, much like flax, mustard, or canola. Uh, the main differences uh, between Camelina and some of the other brassicas, Camelina is a very short season crop. Uh, it's ready to harvest in somewhere between 90 and 100 days. Uh, the other, another major difference is that Camelina can withstand cold temperatures. So you can plant it very early and have it harvested before winter wheat harvest. The uses are, the primary use that we're focused on is for renewable diesel, and that's for the California market. I had someone make a comment yesterday that <laughs> uh, we're probably here because of the new administration, and I have to say we're here because California has much more stringent regulations uh, going forward on air quality, and that provides an opportunity for us and for farmers, especially in the Montana area uh, to help uh, help Californians, especially truckers, uh, meet, their, meet their goals on air quality improvement. We, uh, that Sustainable Oils, have the only Camelina that's approved in California for use in renewable diesel. And the benefit of Camelina, because it's grown on, I'll call it a non-food acre, say uh, uh, a, a, uh, we prefer to go on fallow ground, not uh, during the fallow season, so a recrop. Because we're not displacing a food crop, we get extra credit for that in their, the way they calculate their carbon intensity scores and uh, makes Camelina the, the uh, lowest carbon intensity feedstock available for renewable diesel, other than, say, uh, tallow. So who is Sustainable Oils? The company was founded back in 2005, um, improving Camelina, which at the time was really viewed more as a weed than as a crop. Uh, we initiated a uh, full-blown breeding program to improve Camelina. Uh, unfortunately, the original Sustainable Oils went out of business in about 2011. They went bankrupt when oil went back down, went from $140 to $40 per barrel. The assets were purchased by Global Clean Energy Holdings in 2013. Um, and we are in the process of restarting this program uh, to rebuild uh, Camelina Acres to fulfill our needs for this refinery in Bakersfield, California. So some of you on the, on the call uh, were aware last year we were trying to uh, start commercial grain production. 
Uh, unfortunately, COVID hit. We got delayed delays in closing on a uh, 200 million gallon refinery in Bakersfield, California. And until we closed that refinery, in other words, until we were able to make that purchase, uh, we weren't able to execute our grain production ag agreement. So that basically pushed us back a year. Uh, that's all done, that's behind us. Um, you can see in the org chart on the left side of the screen that Global Clean Energy is our parent company and below that there are two uh, holding companies. One is Sustainable Oils, that's the uh, grower facing organization with Camelina and the other is Bakersfield Renewable Fuels um, and Bakersfield, which we'll show in a second, is a fairly significant refinery. Uh, that's where we will install crush facilities. Uh, we have rail into the yard for grain delivery and potentially for uh, fuel export. Uh, we have a long-term takeoff agreement with Exxon Mobil as the uh, marketer of the renewable diesel into the California market and and others as the markets begin to, uh, I guess, develop. So why do, why do we want Camelina? Well, we have this refinery pictured here in Bakersfield, Bakersfield Renewable Fuels, and it's gonna require about 1.5 million acres of Camelina to fill that refinery with 220 million gallons of feedstock a year. Uh, we have a, a partner waiting for the renewable diesel to start coming out of this refinery. Currently the refinery is in, uh, in the process of being retrofitted, taking it from petroleum feedstock to a vegetable oil feedstock. That should be complete sometime in the late third or early fourth quarter of 2021, when we'll start up to produce renewable diesel. So this year's <clears throat> harvest uh, we'll be going into that uh, facility as the first Camelina oil uh, being converted to renewable diesel. And with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Barry Murphy uh, from ExxonMobil, the commercial fuels director. Um, you can see the beautiful background. Uh, I'm <laughs> jealous every time we have a call because he gets to ski and um, I don't have too much of that in North Carolina. <laughs> Barry, go ahead. Thanks, Bernie. Yeah, it uh, it actually was a pretty good uh, a pretty good ski uh, year, uh, even though we had uh, a few weeks there of like minus forty uh, degrees uh, temperature. Um, but uh, no, it was uh, it was a good year. Well, hey, um, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you guys taking the time, uh, giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, why Exxon Mobil is so excited to be partnering with uh, Sustainable Oils. And maybe Nancy will just get you to flip to the first slide there, please. You know, we, uh, you know, we at ExxonMobil, we are constantly looking at different renewable projects around the world to participate in. And what, what really interested us uh, and differentiated this project was it wasn't the location or the refining technology that they're looking at, but it was really the expertise that we saw within sustainable oils the expertise and the focus that they had on the feedstock Camelina, the expertise and the focus that they had on the research and development program on the seed technology to advance yields. And of course, the expertise and the focus on enhancing agricultural practices. So it was really for these reasons that ExxonMobil has established this long-term relationship uh, with uh, sustainable oils and, and GCE to market, sell and distribute the renewable diesel that will be produced at the Bakersfield facility. You know, I think a lot of people um, today uh, maybe don't realize that not all renewable fuels are created equal. Uh, I think, you know, we see governments, the federal or state level kind of mandating a certain blend of renewables. So I think we kind of, a lot of folks just assume, well, they must all be the same. But we heard Bernie uh, talk earlier about the difference in terms of with Camelina. And it's important for us to understand that there's a wide spectrum of renewable fuels with respect to the impact on the environment. 
you know, some fuels um, are made from feedstocks that really, you know, aren't very sustainable. And, you know, if you think about it, if you have to, you know, burn down a rainforest, plant a crop, then sail that crop, you know, uh, halfway around the world, all doing that in order to fuel a truck uh, in California, that's not really a sustainable path. But because Camelina is produced here in America, it's produced on recrop acres, it offers us significantly higher benefits from an environmental perspective and a more sustainable fuel, which a lot of customers are really excited about. So I think it's for all of those reasons, you know, why, uh, you know, ExxonMobil, uh, you know, is partnering uh, like CHS, like United Grains, uh, why we're partnering uh, with sustainable oils on this uh, initiative. So, you know, let's talk about customers, um, you know, so, you know, after the product, after the Camelina leaves your farm, you know, what's the end use of this product? Well, what Camelina allows us to do through that refinery process is produce a really high quality fuel that can be used, uh, you know, by customers really to power our economy. The high quality fuel uh, can be used in almost any application that we typically see a diesel uh, consume today. Because of the location of this refinery, in central California. This means that a large amount of this product will be used within the agricultural sector, which kind of surrounds the, uh, the valley. We also know that many um, rail companies, trucking transportation companies have established um, you know, corporate goals of how they wanna reduce their carbon footprint. And this fuel provides them a great tool in terms of for them to help achieve those goals. We've also had interest from other sectors, you know, municipalities, uh, you know, school bus fleets, garbage trucks, you know, construction and paving have all expressed a strong interest for this product come 2022 when we start to bring it on stream. It's, it's actually pretty exciting to talk to folks and, um, you know, they get quite excited and you, when you explain this to them and they understand what a positive impact they can have by just simply making a different choice in the fuel that they use. You know, just, yeah. What's the difference between renewable diesel and biodiesel? Just so oh, for the group. Great question. Uh, all right, maybe we'll flip to the next slide there. Uh, I think that's, you know, a good, a good lead in. Um, oh, wrong direction. Whoops, thank you. Thanks, Nance. Um, yeah, so, you know, I've used the term renewable diesel. So, um, you know, what exactly does that mean, right? And how is that different than, you know, biodiesel or conventional petroleum diesel that folks probably pick up at their local town pump? So let's talk about, you know, these three products. First, you know, conventional petroleum diesel, I think kind of pretty familiar with this one. The feedstock that goes in this is, you know, petroleum crude oil. It goes through a very complex refining process, uh, like the one that we have in Billings, uh, with you know distillation, hydro treating, and we produce a whole stream of products from that barrel, from the very top light ends, like a jet fuel, gasoline, diesel, and then at the bottom of the barrel, kind of bunker fuels and asphalt, and that's kind of the typical refining process with petroleum. Now. When we look at bio and renewable diesel, the big difference here is instead of crude, we're using some type of a vegetable oil or an animal tallow as the feedstock to kick off the process. But I would say that's, that's really where the difference um, stops or you know, the similarities uh, stop because from that point on, a biodiesel and a renewable diesel are very different. So with a, a biodiesel, and a lot of people, you know, biodiesel has been around in the market for you know, probably about 20 years now or, or longer. Um, and, you know, many folks may have seen it as kind of a B5, um, you know, at different pumps, or sometimes it's marketed as a, as a B20. And the, the bio product uh, is a much simpler uh, process that it goes through. It's a chemical process and it produces what we call um, FAME or a fatty acid methyl ester. With crude oil, we, we use the term hydrocarbons. That's the chemical base of what crude oil is. So right off the bat, we know that bio is gonna be different because of it being the ester. So when we look at renewable diesel, even though we start off with the same feedstock going into the process, 
renewable diesel goes through a very similar refining process as that of crude oil. Um, and what we do with that is put it through that refining process and we produce a stable hydrocarbon that really is a chemically similar, a chemically the same to a crude oil. So why is that important? Like why, why is that such a big deal and why is it such an advantage? Well, the big advantage is it can be used as a complete drop-in fuel, which means you don't need to worry about trying to clean your tanks. You don't need to worry about the blending procedures that you have with a traditional bioproduct. It's chemically interchangeable with conventional diesel uh, product. Now, there are some differences, Barney, as well, with some of the properties of um, between these three products. And I'll just talk about a couple of the, the most important ones that, that folks may um, be thinking about. The first one is blending. As I mentioned before, most equipment manufacturers will only allow you to blend about 5%, sometimes up to 20% of bio into the conventional diesel product. And that's just because of the chemical makeup of the product. It's not a hydrocarbon. Renewable diesel, you can blend up to 100%, complete interchangeable. So that's one of the real advantages that helps make renewable diesel kind of like the Cadillac in the renewable diesel space. Um, the next one is your tank stability. Um, because biodiesel has oxygen in it, unlike petroleum diesel and renewable diesel, um, the bacteria really love that and they like to grow in terms of in that oxygen rich environment in your fuel tank. So that can cause issues in terms of with some filter plugging and some other challenges with, uh, with bio. The next area that I would uh, mention would be energy density, obviously critically important in terms of from, you know, dollars and cents. Um, when we compare it to petroleum, if you think of petroleum as kind of being about, you know, 100%, your bio is probably going to be about 90%, uh, so like a 10% loss of energy density. The renewable diesel that we're making here is still a little bit lower, but it's kind of more in the, you know, 4 to 5% uh, lower energy density. So another uh, big difference. Um, cold flow properties, uh, very important in terms of for Montana. Um, bio does not have the same cold flow uh, properties that a renewable diesel or a conventional diesel will have. And then finally, um, renewable diesel and bios might have high cetane values. And, you know, depending on the engine, uh, you know, a high cetane can actually help improve, uh, you know, combustion, uh, stability and performance. So Barney, those are probably the key areas when we talk about the differences between those three products that um, I like to highlight and, and make sure folks are uh, kind of thinking about. Okay. So um, maybe why don't I continue? I'll just talk a little bit um, about, you know, I talked about why we were involved and, um, you know, if you just go to the next slide there, I, I do think it's important um, that, you know, folks understand, you know, we, this opportunity for us to participate um, with Stale is critically important. Um, you know, we look at our role in terms of as ExxonMobil as kind of powering the U.S. out of this pandemic. We know that economic growth, it really depends on rateable, reliable, and affordable access to energy. And we have a dual challenge in trying to achieve all those things. We need to do all those things at a very cost-efficient method, but we also need to do it in terms of making sure that we're minimizing um, emissions and the environmental impact. So it's that dual challenge that we're really focused on. And we think it's innovation, um, like we're talking about here, that can play a, a big part in that energy transition and that energy evolution as we refer to it as. I mean, we'll just go to the, the final slide and um, I just wanted to talk about, you know, obviously, um, you know, we're a big part of the, you know, Montana community, uh, you know, like, like folks like yourself, community is critically important. We invest and participate as much as we can in the communities that we operate in whether it's through charities or support for local uh, initiatives. That's kind of what we want to be able to be part of. Um, ExxonMobil also had played a big part in the early days of the pandemic. There's a couple interesting pictures there that we were able to convert some of our refining capacity actually to start to produce isopropyl alcohol, which is a, a key ingredient in terms of in the production of hand sanitizer. 
doesn't seem like a big deal now in terms of, you know, it's, it's all over the place at every, uh, you know, at every store. But in those early days, there was quite a shortage of that. And with, and per month, we were producing 50 million four ounce bottles of medical grade hand sanitizer after, ref, after tweaking some of our refining processes. That product was going out to hospitals as well as supporting our military. So a lot of things that we're, we're proud of in terms of being able to be part of the community, certainly part of the, the Billings community in, in Montana. So again, we're pretty excited to be a partner with Sustainable Oils here as we look at this energy evolution and transition. So over to you, Barney. Great, thanks, Barry, I appreciate that. Uh, let's uh, switch gears and uh, Mike Karst, who's listed as Barney Bernstein too, on the uh, screens, <laughs> my, be my better half, uh, will take us from here. So thanks, Barney, and, and thanks, Rick, Barry. I, I got to tell you, Barry, um, when, when I came back and joined uh, Sustainable Oils for round two, uh, having you guys on board made all the difference in the world in, in helping me make that decision. So I sure am glad you guys are able to, to join us as we uh, grow the company together. So, you know, back to why we need sustainable oils needs Camelina. Well, ExxonMobil has a demand plan and, and uh, we need everything that Montana growers can produce. Uh, that's one of the key things that I want to make sure you take away is that the contract with sustainable oils to produce Camelina has no limitations on what you can grow. The more you grow, the more you get paid and we want to take every bit of it. Uh, we don't want to have any... Um, uh, these contracts that, that guarantee you a price on the first, uh, the first uh, several hundred bush, um, several hundred pounds, and then leave the rest to an open market situation. So, what we've do, done is design a contract that uh, our goal is to always to provide you with a consistent and fair price, so that you don't have the the commodity ups and downs that are basically feast or famine situations for you, and also to be quite honest, feast and famines for us. We'd rather partner with growers long term to, to make sure that um, you can make money. And if you make money, you'll continue to grow for us. And that provides us a reliable and consistent supply. So uh, Camelina produced on recrop acres is the lowest carbon intensity of any renewable diesel feedstock. And, and this, is a, this is a California um, uh, uh, issue that we're facing here. How can we produce renewable diesel with the lowest carbon intensity possible. And Camelina, because it, it uses relatively low amount of water, relatively low amount of fertilizer, um, and we're putting it on recrop acres in typically uh, quite dry environments. It allows us to get a, a very low carbon intensity score. And, and that's uh, vitally important to us and, and obviously vitally important uh, as we head down the lane into into Exxon marketing the product for us. Barney, next slide. So, you know, why should you grow Camelina acres? Well, if you've got fallow acres, we can turn those into profit acres. Uh, the combination of wheat followed by Camelina can have a positive impact for your farm. If you think about what a fallow acre costs you, and let's include land rent. So if we're looking in the $30 an acre range for land cost, and then another 30 or $40 an acre for chemical cost. And then, you know, you've got some spraying costs, your, your labor and your machinery costs to go across those acres to keep the weeds out of your fallow. You're, you're losing, you know, somewhere in that uh, 40 to $70 per acre per year that you've got fallow. So now you start your, your next wheat year and you're already that, num that uh, amount of dollars behind. So one of the common questions we get is, well, if I don't go, wheat, camelina, and then back to wheat instead of having that fallow year, you know, am I going to lose wheat yield in that third year? And uh, my answer always is, you tell me what the weather is going to be and I'll tell you if you're going to lose yield. A couple of years ago when we started in Montana in 2019, we had that question and we said, we'll see. Now, as it turned out, all of our growers had relatively good rainfall in 2020 and they didn't see any difference whatsoever. But Mother Nature is fickle, and we know that sometimes droughts come along. So in those dry years, uh, if there is a wheat yield reduction following Camelina, 
you can still expect that you're making about $40 per acre per year over having a wheat fallow rotation. So as, as we look at the economics, you know, we're encouraging people to begin to try this and put it in place of fallow acres as a recrop behind uh, wheat is where it typically goes. So how do you grow camelina? Well, these pictures all came out of Montana over the last few years. Uh, that first picture with the uh, John Deere air seeder was taken on May the 5th of uh, 2019 in Judith Basin. Uh, within about uh, three weeks, uh, you see the, the next field where it's the, the um, small rosettes in, in between the, the wheat stubble there. Uh, and then within a very short period of time, Camelina flower occurred. So you might think of this as from emergence to flowering is going to be about a 30 day period. And to tell you how fast it emerge, uh, emerges with, with moisture and a soil temperature of, of 70 degrees in our, in our growth chambers we use for testing for bioassays, we see germination occur within the first 24 hours. And we see crops coming out of the ground within 48 to 72 hours. So then uh, the next picture we go down to, the setting pods and seeds, that's about your second uh, uh, 30 day or your last 30 days. So you've got 30 days of vegetative growth, 30 days of flowering, and then about 30 days of setting the pod seeds and, and then drying down. So it ends up being between a 90 and a 100 day crop. And it, it tends to be the higher the elevation, the, a little takes a little bit longer if you get into, into higher elevations. And then the picture on the um, bottom center there is what it looks like when it's ready to harvest. Uh, it is a crop that uh, when you're harvesting, it is a little bit slower to harvest. You're pulling a lot of biomass into your combine. The seeds actually thresh out very easy. Uh, and you do end up with uh, that big peak you see in that combine there. It does peak up pretty high in the tank. Um, the seed comes in two different package sizes, 900, and that says 20 pound totes, but I believe it's 960 60. pound totes. Yeah. Um, and that's going to do 160 acres at a six pound seeding rate. Or you can get it in 50 pound bags, which does about eight acres per bag. Uh, the fertility is, is very similar to your wheat program. Uh, herbicides, we have Sonland pre-emergence and uh, Clethodem uh, post-emergence labeled. And John, uh, what, is, uh, what is the CHS brand of Clethodem? John McFarland. He's muted. Yeah, he's muted. He's running a fertilizer plant. He may have had to step away. Um, that, so I don't I don't remember the brand name of the CHS uh, uh, Clethodem, but Clethodem is a post-emerge grass control product. That's one of the advantages of this crop. If you have a field that you're fighting the cheap grass issues or other grasses in your typical uh, wheat rotation. This is a crop where you can uh, have some control with your sunland pre-emergent and any grass that comes up. If you spray it in this stage, um, Barney, put your uh, cursor up there on the rosette stage, would you? If you oh, yeah. spray it in that stage right there with clethodim, you're gonna get over 99% grass control in the field on a pre-emergent, uh, post-emergent basis. There is one insect that is particularly thrilled to see camelina come into a rotation, and that's a, a worm called army cutworms. In that rosette stage, once again in the middle of your page, if you have army cutworm eggs in your field, and those eggs were laid last summer, uh, this field where you're in the rosettes can go from that rosette stage to bare soil in about four days. Uh, we've never seen a field yet that can be sprayed and saved once you see the damage to occur. So. We strongly encourage uh, cyhalothrin or bifenthrin as a uh, pre-emergent uh, application over the top of the, the ground. The worms come up out of the ground, they crawl across the ground and that, that little bit of insecticide will take care of the worms and you'll never know they were ever in the field. So if we flip to the next slide, so the first thing is to choose uh, choose the right fields. It, it must be in a recrop situation. 
you need to consider your previous herbicides. Group two herbicides like Beyond, like Ally, like Olympus, those products have replant intervals or, uh, or, or recropping intervals that we have to pay special attention to because they are dependent on your soil pH, pH for breakdown and as well as uh, rainfall and, and your timing of application and rate. So those are things that if, if you're considering doing this, uh, Barney and my number will be on the, the uh, last slide that we'll be looking at. Uh, please give us a call and talk to us about it. We, we keep a pretty good list of what you can and can't use and, and how long we have to have in between application and planting the camelina. The second thing is control the weeds. Uh, glyphosate plus sunland uh, applied pre-emergence. You can add AIM. If you've got some uh, Roundup resistant weeds, you can put that in uh, for pre-emergence as well. Um, you need to control the insects early. The, the insects depend on your soil temperature. If you were planting this into soil temperatures that are above 45 degrees, I would put the insecticide in with your glyphosate and sunline when you spray it. If you're planting, let's say this week, and I, I heard talk of frost in the ground, but let's say you, you are able to get across your field and your soil temperatures are still in perhaps uh, the, the um, mid to high 30s. I wouldn't spray my insecticide now because there's no bugs to kill. I would go ahead and, and seed the crop. And then at about the time the crop is coming out of the ground, I'd go ahead and spray the insecticide at that time because the insecticides are gonna come out of the ground at about the same soil temperature as when the camelina is gonna come out of the ground, about 45 degrees. Fertility is gonna be like, like wheat, nitrogen at about 100 pounds per acre of available nitrogen. Now that includes what's in the soil, so you need a soil test to say how much is there and then deduct that from that 100 pounds. Uh, phosphate. Uh, 25 to 30 pounds available for the crop. Here again, depending on your soil test and your local agronomist can help you uh, figure that out. And then sulfur, this is a crop that likes sulfur. So we do recommend 20 to 25 pounds per acre of sulfur. Now, one of the questions we often get on nitrogen in particular is, can we put it on when we plant? And the answer is yes, but it's gotta be off to the side of the seed. It can't be on top of the seed at that, that high rate of, uh, that high, that high of rate of nitrogen, you've got to put it off to the side. The phosphate and the sulfur, uh, th those should be low enough rates you can put them in with the seed if necessary. Uh, broadcasting nitrogen is just fine and the crop does not appear to prefer urea versus UAN. Either one seems to work just fine for a, a nitrogen source. Planting timing, anytime you can get across the field from this point on to May 1st, we need you, and this is this is the one of the most important things is one quarter inch deep is your target depth. We used to say one one quarter to one half, but what farmers seem to hear was one to two inches. We want to aim for one quarter inch. That means you're going to get some at a half inch. You're going to get some at an eighth of an inch or even on top of the ground. That's okay. We're asking you to plant six pounds per acre, and six pounds is about two million seeds per acre that you're going to be dropping and also make sure to do at least a five degree offset to your previous crop rows. The reason for that is at one quarter inch deep with this tiny, tiny seed, if you hit a row head on, you're going to hairpin the organic matter and the seed will lay inside of the, that organic matter and never actually touch the soil and it won't emerge. So at least a five degree offset to your previous crop. After the crop is up, the thing you have to look at is, is spraying for grass control with plethid and post. You need that to do that before the seed head begins to bolt. Seed head bolting starts to take place at about 28 days after emergence. So if I were the, in your shoes and I were doing this, I would be looking for that range of 21 to 28 days. I would be spraying the clethodim at that point. If your seed head begins to bolt, you can't spray the clethodim because you can cause some flower abortion, and that's gonna hurt your yield. The, the, the big reason that the controlling grass is most, is most important for us, and, and there is an advantage for you, volunteer grass, including volunteer wheat, is the most common cause of um, unacceptably high foreign material in the, in the grain when you harvest it. Uh, 
the green, the wheat seeds, when you harvest this crop, will typically still be a little bit on the green side. So they're going to increase your green sample moisture. And because they're green and they're heavy, it increases your foreign material. And there is a dockage um, for going over 15% foreign material. And when we've had that dockage, it's been primarily uh, volunteer wheat heads. And the clethodim will solve that for a really low price if you spray it early. So finally on harvest, uh, harvest is the most important thing as far as the uh, uh, making sure the grain gets in the tank. Combine settings are critical. You're going to set up. Go ahead, Kevin. Kevin, do you have a question? Okay. Um, I think he's, I hear him very faintly, Mike. So I don't know if he was like on another call or if he was actually trying yeah, to say something. Yeah, he, 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 he muted it. So. Okay. okay. Uh, you're going to want to set your combines for harvesting canola or mustard, someone, something very similar to that. What we're looking for is a low fan speed and shutting down the top sieves and the bottom sieves to just a few millimeters each. Uh, the idea here is to allow those little tiny seeds to fall through and at the same time to allow the pods and foreign material to, to blow off the back. If you're a first time small seed grower, you're gonna look in that tank as you're going through the field and you're gonna look and say, my God, what a mess have I got back there. It is filthy. And your first inclination is gonna be to turn up the fan speed. I will caution you again, don't do it. Uh, it is really easy for you to blow six to 700 pounds the acre of seed out the back and you'll never know it's going. And, and as an example, the very first field that Barney and I were at for, uh, for harvest in 2019, uh, the farmer decided to open up the end rows and one pass up the middle to see, uh, see how it was doing. And he, we got there and he said, guys, it's only making seven or 800 pounds the acre. And um, we got the combine started and, and one of our guys got in the combine with, with the farmer and I was behind the combine with, with Barney and we were looking at the seed coming out and we just stopped him and said, what's your fan set setting? And he was over a thousand RPMs. Uh, once we knocked him down to about 500, guess what? We got about 700 pounds the acre back in the tank. So we expect the trash. We need to be careful that we don't blow the grain out the back of the combine. Hey Mike, we got a chat from John. He said um, the CHS clefidim is Gatlin. Okay, John, can you uh, while you're there, can you look up the Cy halothrin and bifenthrin as well, and let us know what those are? Oh, and he also said they have a great price on it. <laughs> and they do. I, I know. I I know the price, and it's uh, it's come way down from a couple years ago. So Barney, if you'll go ahead and, and bounce to the next slide. Oh, wait a minute, gotta get rid of the chat, sorry. Hmm. Yep. So, you, you know, with, with a lot of specialty crops, uh, you may or may not know where you're gonna be hauling it to. With Camelina, we have five different delivery points in the state of Montana. And uh, at this, with this uh, scattering, uh, most of the growers that uh, will be growing Camelina are within 60 miles of a delivery point. This is going to be a buyer's call. Uh, we don't have grain storage available at any of these facilities that uh, we can just turn on at the flip of a switch. So our intent is to start the inbound uh, buyer's call in October and to be finished by January of 2022 for this crop we're about to plant. Uh, those locations um, are, are going to provide their uh, access to their tracks, access to their scales, uh, and help us in, in gathering the grain samples. Um, when we talk about a buyer's call, uh, the, the process will be, you know, we, we don't want to drag you guys out. If I can have any control over it at all, I want to make sure that when we call you to bring in your grain, we want you to bring it all in at once. And once again, we take everything you can produce. And of course, you'll have your choice of uh, where we go. If, if we got anybody that's in between Shelby and, and Haver, um, I know a lot of people don't like that scale at the, on the uh, west side of Haver, so they prefer to go to the west anyway, over towards Shelby or down towards Kershaw. So it, it would certainly be your choice where you'd prefer to haul. Next. 
So let's talk about the money because that's what everyone wants to know. We have what we call the shared risk contract. Uh, to be blunt, guys, the crop insurance on this crop is really, really wow. not very attractive. <laughs> uh, we saw some we saw some quoted prices today that were just rather disgusting. That's one of the reasons we have a base payment of eighty dollars per acre, and that is paid after stand establishment. So you're going to go you're going to go ahead. You're going to plan it. We'll provide you the planning protocols. Barney and I will be here to provide agronomic advice. If you have at least a million plants per acre that emerge, you're going to get eighty dollars per acre after we come and look at the field and do the stand count. It doesn't matter what happens to that acre after we, after we were there. If, if, we, uh, if we approve it on a Wednesday afternoon and you get hailed out on Thursday morning, you still get the $80 an acre because we, we uh, proved that it was there. That $80 um, then is your prepay on the first 400 pounds of crop you bring into the elevator. So the, then there's a variable payment on the 401st pound and then going up to everything you produce, we pay 16 cents a pound. Uh, that is paid on delivery. And like I said, it's a buyer's call. So we, we pull a sample, we're gonna send the samples to uh, national um, quality inspections in, in Great Falls. We'll get the foreign material calculation back from them and we will pay you on all the clean grain above 400 pounds per acre, 16 cents. If we think about what that means, over the last two years as we've done um, uh, several fields, primarily across the high line, we've been getting about an average over two years at about 1,300 pounds of clean grain per year. So let's do the math. You get the $80 establishment, uh, $80 per acre establishment, then we have 400 pounds that's gone. So that's 1,300 minus 400 pounds is 900 pounds times 16 cents. That equals $144. So 144 plus 80, you're, you're looking at 224 an acre for your gross payment. As we think about the seed, chemical, and fertilizer cost, that's going to work out to be in that $85 to $95 per acre range. Uh, we do require you to follow our best management practices, and there's nothing that's onerous there, guys. There's nothing that's uh, uh, terribly hard to do, but we've learned a few things, and we want to make sure that um, we share those with you, and, and this is a document we provide to all of our growers. On the buyer's call, if we don't have it out of your bin by December, uh, October. December 31st, October 31st, we pay four cents per bushel per month for each month after that that point. So starting the 1st of November, we start paying. Um, there is one other uh, uh, upside here potential. If you were able to get below a 15% foreign material in your grain clean out, for every 1% you go down, you get 5 cents more per bushel. If we go back to that 1300 pound yield, that would add another six dollars and fifty cents per acre to that two twenty four. So, the the top end uh, bonus on foreign material at six fifty plus two twenty four, you're looking at uh, two hundred and thirty dollars and fifty cents an acre. Next slide, Barney. Ryan. There we go. There we go. The last slide. Um, so you've got our, our information there. Barney and I split the state. Um, Barney gets uh, Choteau County and uh, Liberty County on the north and Cascade County. And then I take everything to the east. So mm -hmm. and, and our uh, local phone numbers are there uh, as well as our email addresses. So let's, uh, let's open it up for questions. Can we unmute everybody, Nancy? They, they self-mute, so they're unmuted okay. by me. So who do we still have left? Boy, we bored everyone except three <laughs> growers to death. We got Clark. Oh, Kevin. Uh, Clark, Clark, Kevin, Chuck, and Tom, Tom. Right here. Any questions? I have a quick question on the uh, the byproducts. You talked about uh, the byproducts suitable for animal feed. Yeah. Who would know about that? And is that is that 
um, primarily directed to ruminants or is it a monogastric uh, type meal as well? It's, it's both, Tom. We, uh, uh, Camelina is approved by CVM and AFCO um, at a up to 10% inclusion rate for uh, uh, cattle in feedlots and uh, for poultry and swine. Uh, and we're working on dairy cattle. I don't know why they didn't include dairy cows, and this goes back <clears throat> 10 or 12 years, um, but we're working on getting dairy cows included in that uh, also. The 10% inclusion rate maximum is uh, because we have uh, some level of glucosinolates in the meal, and that, uh, that caps the, the use rate or the inclusion rate. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You bet. Um, the positive thing on uh, that, at least, uh, uh, well, for for eggs, well, for all for all of these applications in animal feed, is uh, camelina tends to be higher in omega three fatty acids than uh, other sources, and uh, those will translate into health benefits or uh, higher omega three levels. Uh, in animals fed if it's an expeller um, crushed. Now we do hexane extraction because we want to maximize oil, but um, depending on what the, what the buyer wants, we can add oil back to a uh, meal. Hey Barney, um, Chuck had a question. He said, what about irrigated? And asked if you could talk a little bit more about the recrop requirements. Uh, the recrop is a function of uh, the carb standards, the way they calculate the uh, carbon intensity. They have uh, in their algorithm, they have, uh, I guess, a, a negative associated with uh, taking away a food acre. And so that's why we focus on recrop. Um, we do have situations where we're uh, looking at double crop or you know, one of the things we have to talk about, a lot of farmers have a need for uh, replacing current crops in rotation for uh, agronomic benefits. And that's one thing Camelina brings as an oil seed into uh, some of the areas of Montana. So that's something we have to adjust for. Uh, on irrigated, there was a question about irrigated. So, um, our experience on irrigated camelina is that uh, the yields are going to be significantly increased uh, by uh, uh, probably 50% is what we've seen so far. Our, our experience on irrigation is really on seed acres. That's where we'd focus irrigation. Um, but I think for what Chuck's doing, if they have both dry land and irrigated, it would be pretty interesting this year to take a look at uh, what the impacts of irrigated versus dry land and be able to capture, uh, capture data off that because that can help our agronomic recommendations going forward. Yeah, this is Chuck. Um, so we, we raised Camelina for maybe half a dozen years in the maybe ending about 2010 or 12, and we had some problems, well, because we're, we're in West Cascade County and uh, only about 12 inches of rainfall a year. So we're right on the edge of being able to recrop. And uh, I, I've, I actually had a winter wheat failure uh, in following Camelina, whereas following peas, we, uh, they seem to take just a little bit less water out and uh, we can successfully recrop behind them. But, and that's why I asked about the irrigated because I've got a couple small irrigated patches that uh, I might be willing to try. Okay. And it's certainly something, Chuck, we can, uh, we can talk about it um, when we're done. Give me a call. Sure. Or I'll call you. <laughs> Any other questions? 
if not, we uh, we want to thank you all, especially for hanging in. We went a little longer than we we anticipated, but the questions uh, were really good, and uh, we hope we hope that we can have uh, all of you on board as Camelina growers in 2021 and beyond. Thanks very much, and thanks. Uh, let's thanks the uh, Exxon Mobil folks for uh, participating and giving their show of support today. Great, our pleasure. Look, Thank you, Rudy. Look forward to working with everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.